Hello, and welcome back to Chapter 2. Today we're going to look at implicit differentiation in Section 2.5. Our goals are going to be to distinguish between functions that are written in implicit form versus explicit form, and we're going to learn how to use implicit differentiation to find the derivative of a function. So first, let's look at what implicit and explicit functions are. Most of the functions that we've dealt with have been expressed in what we call the explicit form. In other words, y has been explicitly written as a function of x. And an example of this is just right here, where y equals 3x squared minus 5. Okay, now some functions are only implied by an equation. So if I give you something like y equals 1 divided by x, even though it's not written implicitly, it's if you rearrange it, you actually do get a, an implicit form, which is xy equals 1. Now in this case, if we take that xy equals 1 equation, or the implicit form, we can actually write it in an explicit form by isolating the variable y. So if we do that, then we can go ahead and take the derivative um, of y with respect to x, or dy dx, and come up with this right here. However, we are not always able to isolate y like we were able to up here in this example. If you look at the example of x squared minus 2y cubed plus 4y equals 2, and you try to find, or you try to isolate y initially, you'll see that it's, it's pretty difficult um, to do. And because we can't isolate y, we can't go ahead and find dy dx for this equation. Now, we can go ahead and do this if we use implicit differentiation, which we're going to go over here in just one second. But before we do that, I want you to first understand that when we write the term dy dx, we are really taking the derivative of y with respect to x, which is what the dx means. So when we differentiate terms with just x's, okay, we're going to go ahead and take the derivative as we normally would. However, when we go to take a derivative of y's, like in the, this case here, we're going to have to apply the chain rule because we're going to assume that y is defined implicitly as a differentiable function of x. And this sounds way more complicated than what it really is. So let's first look at a couple guidelines for implicit differentiation, then we're going to do an example. So with our implicit differentiation, we're going to be given some guidelines. And these guidelines say, for step one, we are going to differentiate both sides of the equation with respect to x. Once we've done that, we're going to collect all of our dy dx terms on the left side of the equation and move everything else to the right side. Then we're going to factor out any dy dx's that we can from the left, and then we're going to solve or isolate the dy dx in the end. That is our ultimate goal, is to get dy dx by itself and everything else on the other side of the equation. And you say, how are we going to do that? Well, let's look at our first example. For this example, we want to find dy dx given that y, we have y cubed plus y squared minus 5y minus x squared equals a negative 4. So to do this, we're going to start out with our first term, and we're going to differentiate it just like we would if this was an x term. So we are going to end up with 3 y squared. Now, because this is not an x term, we need to include the dy dx. And we have to include that so that we know that we're going to differentiate y with respect to x. And to continue on, we're going to add the derivative of y squared is going to be 2y, and because I don't have that x factor, I'm also going to include dy dx, then I'm going to subtract the derivative of 5y is going to be 5 dy dx, and then minus, now because x squared is a function of x, I'm just going to differentiate as we quote unquote normally would, and then equals, and the derivative of negative 4 is going to be 0. So this is my step 1. Now, step two is going to be to collect all my dy dx terms, which in this case would be this term, this term, and this term, and set them on 
the left hand side of the equation. And as I do that, I'm actually going to factor out the dy dx. So I will be left with 3y squared plus 2y minus 5. And I'm going to put the dy dx on the outside here. And I'm going to set that equal to a positive 2x. So what I did is I moved this 2x over to this side. Now, my last step is to get dy dx by itself. So I want to isolate this piece right here, and I can see that this piece is being multiplied by the dy dx. So to undo that, I'm going to have to divide, and I'm left with dy dx is equal to 2x divided by 3y squared plus 2y minus 5. And this is my final derivative. For our next example, we want to determine the slope of the graph of x squared plus 4y squared equals 4 at the point square root of 2 and then negative 1 over the square root of 2. So I'm going to go ahead and do this just like I would, or like we have been all along. I'm going to take the derivative of the equation. So when I take the derivative, I end up with 2x plus 4 times 2 is going to give me 8 y. Now, y, the 4y squared terms does not include x's, so I am going to have to include that dy dx, and I'm going to set that equal to 0. So now I need to go and get my dy dx term by itself, so I'm going to move the x over to the right hand side. So I have 8y dy dx equals a negative 2x, and dy dx then is equal to a negative 2x divided by 8y or dy dx equals a negative x divided by 4y. So this right here is the equation of the derivative. Now I want to evaluate that at the point square root of 2 and negative 1 over the square root of 2. So we're going to be left with dy dx is equal to a negative, and x was the square root of 2. We're going to divide that by 4 times a negative 1 divided by the square root of 2. So when I rewrite this, I have a negative square root of 2 divided by 4 divided by the square root of 2, and this is also a negative. So if I rewrite that, I have the square root of 2 times the square root of 2 over 4. I did drop my negatives because they're going to cancel. And the square root of 2 times the square root of 2 is going to give me 2 divided by 4. So the actual slope then is going to equal 1 half. Example 5 is going to be similar to what we've already done, where we have to determine the slope of the graph of the equation 3 times the quantity of x squared plus y squared squared equals 100xy, and we're going to find the slope at the point 3, 1. So we're still going to start out by taking the derivative. So I have to apply the chain rule over here. I'm going to bring this 2 down up front to give us 6 times the quantity of x squared plus y squared, and this is going to be raised to the first. Now I have to multiply that by the derivative of the inside, which is going to be 2x plus 2y dy dx. And then this is going to equal 100 times, I have a product rule, so I have first times the derivative of the second, which is just going to give me 1 dy dx plus the second times the derivative of the first, and the derivative of x is just 1. So when I simplify this, we end up with 6, and I'm just going to distribute that 6 onto the x squared plus 6y squared, and we're going to multiply that by 2x plus 2y dy dx, and that's going to equal 100 dy dx plus 100y. 
Now, my goal is to get my dy dx terms on one side and everything else on the other. So to do that, I'm going to distribute or FOIL these two terms right here. And when I do that, I end up with 12x cubed plus 12x squared y dy dx plus 12xy squared plus 12y cubed dy dx and this equals the 100 dy dx plus 100y. The next step will be to isolate your dy dx terms, which is this one, this one, and this one. So that gives us 12x squared y. And I'm going to go ahead and factor that dy dx out right now, too. Plus 12y cubed. I am going to have to move the 100 dy dx over, so that's going to become minus 100. And we're going to multiply that by dy dx. And then this is going to equal 12x cubed, which I have to move to the other side. Um, so let's go ahead and write the 100 first. So I have 100y and then minus that 12x cubed. And then I'm going to subtract this 12xy squared. So now I need to isolate dy dx, and to do that, I'm going to have to divide by this term. And that is going to give us dy dx is equal to 100y minus 12x cubed minus 12xy squared divided by... 12x squared y plus 12y cubed minus 100. And because you have 12s and 100s, 4 will go into both of those nicely, so I could even factor out a 4. And if I factor out a 4, we end up with 25y minus 3x cubed minus... 3xy squared divided by 3x squared y plus 3y cubed minus 25. And this would be your final solution then. And then to complete this problem, we wanted to find the slope at the point of 3, 1. I apologize for my tractor playing kid here making noises. But we were given the point of 3, 1. And actually, before we go ahead and uh, find the point at the derivative, I realized I made a mistake and actually went all the way back up here. When we distribute this 100 onto this term here, I forgot to include the x with that. So there should be an x in all of these terms here and another x is going to go over here with this 100 and we should have another x here and that should be 25x I'm really sorry about that so now we can plug in our point 31 and we are left with 25 times 1 <coughs> minus 3 times 3 cubed, which will give us 27, minus 3 times 3 times 1 squared, divided by 3 times 3 squared, which is 9, times 1, plus 3 times 1 cubed, minus 25 times 3. So when we simplify this, we end up with 
a negative 65 divided by a negative 45, which will reduce down to 13 ninths. So all of that worked to get a slope of 13 ninths. But we are done now. And just for those of you that were curious, if you were to have graphed this original function, you would have gotten something that looks kind of like this figure eight curve, which we did talk about last year in pre-calc. Okay, and the slope of the curve at the point 3, 1 looks like this. So this right here is the equation or the slope that we just calculated. And now for our last example for today, we are going to find the derivative implicitly for the equation sine y equals x. Once we've done that, we're then going to go and try to find the largest interval from one value to another value in y for which y is a differentiable function. Now sine is not, or sine y equals x is not a differentiable function because the graph looks something like this. So first things first, let's go ahead and find the derivative. The derivative of sine y equals x is cosine y, and because we have to take it with respect to x, we're going to write dy dx equals 1. And if I isolate dy dx, then we're left with dy dx equals 1 divided by the cosine of y. And now to look at the part where we want to find the largest interval of the form negative a to a on which y is differentiable, if you look at your graph, I think the graph helps us the most. We need to restrict our function so that we can use the vertical line test. And if you look, that's going to happen between values of y from negative pi all the way up pi over 2 to a positive pi over 2. So we have a negative pi over 2 is less than y, which is less than a positive pi over 2. And what that means is now I can rewrite my function cosine y as an explicit function of x when I'm looking at this range. And to do that, we are going to have to remember one of the trig identities that we learned last year. And if you remember, cosine squared x, or in this case, actually, let's leave it y, plus sine squared y equaled 1. So if we want to get cosine by itself, we have cosine squared y is equal to 1 minus sine squared y, and to get cosine y by itself, we're going to square root both sides, or we'll get cosine y is equal to the square root of 1 minus sine squared y. Well, to write this explicitly, all we have to do is replace our sine squared with an x, so I can rewrite this as 1 minus x squared for values that are in between a negative pi over 2 and a positive pi over 2. In this last little bit here, isn't something you have to worry about right now. Uh, we will get into this more, I believe it's in chapter 5, when we talk about derivatives of the inverse functions. So for right now, this is going to wrap up part 1 of section 2.5. Have a good night, and we'll see you tomorrow.